And away they go. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 18. And I didn't even have to tell you, if you're willing and able, we'll ask you to stand in reverence to the Word of God as we read it together. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he'd considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. And when Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, this morning as we study your word, speak to our hearts. Help us to pick out the necessary and the needful things Help us, Father, to confirm our faith in the things that you reveal to us in your word. We'll thank you for all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We uh, began our study and review of the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ last week. And from Scripture, we know that Israel, in the time when Jesus was born, had been waiting for a Messiah. God had been revealing to them a little bit at a time over time exactly what it was that he planned to do. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we know this is the account of of the fall of man. And at the end of that passage, he said, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He says this to Satan, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So we know that the seed of the woman is going to be part of God's redemptive plan. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, he said, I will make you into a great nation, speaking to Abraham. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So now we know that the Redeemer is going to be the seed of the woman, and he's going to be a descendant of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it is comes and the obedience of the peoples belongs to him. Now we know that the Messiah is going to be the seed of the woman, a descendant of Abraham, and a descendant of Judah. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and have a son and name him. Emmanuel. Now we're told not only what we've already discussed, but we're told that the one who was coming to be the Messiah long before this happened would be somebody born of a virgin. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, A child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of peace. It describes a baby who was coming to fulfill all of those roles. Jeremiah writes, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I raise up a righteous branch of David, he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel, Israel will dwell securely. This is what he called, what, this is what he will be named. Yahweh, our righteousness. Now we know that the Messiah is going to be the seed of the woman, a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of Judah, born of a virgin, and a descendant of David. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
You are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity and from eternity. And in addition to all the things that we've already said that the Lord has revealed to us in prophecy, he even tells us exactly where Jesus was going to be born. From all of these prophecies, we know that God planned to send a Messiah who would be the seed of a woman, a descendant of Abraham, Judah, David, born of a virgin, and born in Bethlehem. But there had been no prophetic voice in Israel for four centuries. They had the scriptures, they had the prophecies, but nobody had come onto the scene to let them know anything about how and when God was going to work out all those details. And then what we know as the Christmas story begins when Gabriel informs Mary of his plans for her by way of review. It says, the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I've not been intimate with a man? And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And in our study last week, we know that Mary had been told that God was going to miraculously conceive a child by the Holy Spirit and she was to name him Yeshua, Jesus. And that angel added after this passage that we read last week, Consider your relative Elizabeth, even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless, for nothing will be impossible with God. So Mary, who is possessed with the overwhelming news that she is about to become a mother, the mother indeed of the Messiah, she apparently decides to travel out to see the one person she thinks might just understand. And the Bible describes the beginning of the encounter between Mary and and Elizabeth this way. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, you are the most blessed of women and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt for joy inside me. She who has believed is blessed because of what is spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. So after a lengthy passage that we studied last week where Mary praises the God's confirming his word to her, the Bible tells us that she stayed with Elizabeth for three months and then went home. Now we transition out of Luke's gospel into Matthew's this morning, and Matthew's rendering of the story begins with a focus on Joseph's experience. We don't know a lot about the circumstances that drew Mary and Joseph to each other in such a way as to result in an engagement which would lead to Mary. We, we would like to think it's some kind of wonderful and romantic love story, the, the kind of stuff that, that makes the Hallmark Channel and all that kind of stuff. We just aren't given any of those details. By the time we know anything about them, they are already engaged and all that information is not given to us. But... I want to tell you that we know a little bit about the culture. We know about history. We know how it worked in that day. And in that day, it generally went like this. Fathers usually initiated and arranged for the engagement or betrothal of their children. And so if a couple of fellas get along pretty good and maybe one of them has a bass boat and the other one has a daughter, I'd kind of like to have you in the family. How about you have your son marry my daughter? No, I'm being a little bit silly about that. But fathers did make the arrangements for whatever reasons they had. Now, a young man could make his preference for a wife known to his family, but the parents were not obligated to act on it. So if Johnny said, oh, that Julie, she looks good to me parents could say, all right, let's see what we can do. Or they could say, no, we don't want that girl in our family. We know that from 
other biblical records. Uh, you might remember this in the case of Samson who told his family, I've seen a young Philistine woman in Timnah now get her for me as wife. And they should have refused because she was not a Jew. Rather, she was a Philistine, and according to God's word, that shouldn't have happened, but they went ahead and accommodated him anyway. That's the way it worked in those days. It didn't require romance. And families were nevertheless bound to remain together for life. Young men and women were pledged to each other at ages as young as 12 or 13. And afterwards came some kind of prenuptial agreement both before witnesses, the young man and the young woman would enter into a formal covenant or contract. It was legally binding, and it gave the man legal rights over the woman. And once a couple entered this stage of betrothal, betrothal it could only be broken by formal divorce. The terms husband and wife were used during this period, even though the couple didn't live together. And during this time, sexual relationships were not per permitted, and it was, uh, if one of them was found to be unfaithful to the other, it was considered adultery. And at the time of Jesus' birth, adultery, you may remember, was punishable by stoning. So that's the cultural background for the passage that we're considering this morning. That's the, the world that they live in. And Matthew begins by stating matter-of-factly, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. In other words, the Old Testament tells us about the, the plans that God has to make it happen in the future. Now Matthew uh, writes, looking backward on how it actually happened, he says, let me tell you how God actually pulled all that off. And he starts by saying, the birth of Jesus Christ happened like this. And he continues... After his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, engaged, betrothed, promised, but not yet living together, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. It had been more than three months since Gabriel visited Mary. Mary had had her encounter with angel, she, uh, with Gabriel the angel. She, she, uh, she had heard what he had to say. Uh, and um, at some point she decides that she's going to go visit Elizabeth. We don't know how much time before that. Then the Bible tells us three months, she spent about three months there, more or less. She was a young woman, probably small of frame, considering the economic hardship that the Jews during, uh, experienced during the Roman occupation. So I've got to wonder, based on that, with maybe she had begun to show. It be, had become obvious that something was going on. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us that that's how it happened. It said it just became known. It, became, it, was, it was discovered. Somehow, she was discovered. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. This is a big deal in her world. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. Remember what I said. Their engagement was a legal contract. It was binding. They were considered husband and wife. And even though they weren't living together yet, even though she had not been delivered to the groom's house, they had not consummated the marriage Because of the contract, a divorce would be required. And Joseph could have said, she was promised to me. She's my wife. She has sinned. She is pregnant. I haven't been anywhere near her. And the penalty could have been stoning. How serious this is. But the Bible says that he was a righteous man. And then in order to qualify that, it says because he was a righteous man, he did not want to disgrace her publicly. And he decided to deal with her secretly. That ought to speak to us, amen? By God's definition, righteous people do not want to throw other folks under the bus. Righteous people don't want to hum humiliate somebody, even if their behavior makes them deserve it. Joseph, the righteous man, 
did not want to disgrace her, did not want to publicly humiliate her. Whatever he was going to do to deal with her, he was going to do in secret. I'm going to tell you something. If you were God, your plan was to bring the Messiah into the world who would be your son. And you were going to place him in the care of a human father. You'd probably want somebody like Joseph. Somebody that walked that close, somebody that had that kind of heart. By the way, in the actions and, 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 and the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ towards sinful human being, Joseph was the kind of guy that could help in the formulation of those kinds of things, amen? He was the kind of guy that modeled it before Jesus as Jesus was growing up. We don't know much about Joseph other than what's stated here. The Bible says he's a righteous man and qualifies it by the way it describes the news that the way he reacted to the news that his fiancee was pregnant. But the Bible says after he considered these things, verse 20, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. And now God intervenes at this crisis point in Joseph's life. Joseph had formulated his plan already for dealing with his apparently unfaithful fiance. It was a considered strategy. He'd given it a lot of thought. It was his best idea for dealing with this. And an angel visits him in a dream and says, go ahead and marry Mary. Her story is absolutely true, no matter how hard it is to believe. Because the angel told Joseph, what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. But for just a second, put yourself into Joseph's shoes. You are engaged. Conceivably, you're looking forward to the time when you take your wife home and you enjoy the rest of your lives together forever. You live in a very conservative Jewish culture. And in that culture, nobody, I mean nobody, gets pregnant during their betrothal or engagement period. The biblical uh, prescription for that is capital punishment. That still went on even into the days of Jesus. You might remember the story in John chapter 8 about the woman that was caught in the act of adultery and they had all formed a circle around her and were ready to stone her to death. It's serious business. This is what Joseph knew. Joseph knew everything that Joseph had been involved in. And he knew that he hadn't had anything to do with anything that would have caused Mary to be pregnant. He wasn't responsible for Mary's pregnancy. So someone else must have been. And her story, when she's discovered, her story is, listen, Joseph, I have been faithful to you, but God made me pregnant. Wait, what? Um, imagine how you'd respond to something like that. This has never happened before to anybody anywhere. This is a one-time good deal in all the history of humanity. This has never happened before and never happened since. A virgin becomes pregnant. That's her story. And Joseph wasn't there when Gabriel made this announcement. And he wasn't there when Elizabeth confirmed God's ability to do the miraculous. He doesn't believe her. Not for a second. I imagine that he was hurt possibly disappointed, maybe angry. But he's come to the conclusion he, he can't possibly continue a relationship with someone who would do something like that because of his better nature. He wants to be as compassionate as possible. And then God sends an angel to redirect him in a dream. And the instruction that follows goes like this. 
she will take Mary, make her your wife. She's going to give birth to a son, and you're to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And the word Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua, literally means the Lord saves. You name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. You name him the Lord saves because that's what he's coming for. In Luke chapter 1, verse 31, in Mary's instruction, said, you will call his name Jesus. In this case, we hear that Joseph is the one that has to give him the name. And that's because naming the child was the father's prerogative. In Luke chapter 1, verse 57, and we find a passage that starts like this. The time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she had a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her his great mercy, and they rejoiced with her. And when they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother responded, No, he will be called John. Then they said to her, None of your relatives has that name. So they motioned to his father to find out what he wanted him to be called. Dad, at this point, still unable to speak. So he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, His name is John. And that name was not officially his until the father gave it to him. And they were all amazed. So Joseph is the one that's to give Jesus the name that represents who he was and why he came. Matthew continues. All of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which trans is translated, God is with us. Jesus Christ was the God-man. Although he had existed from the beginning of eternity, which never began, he had always existed. John's gospel says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it describes Jesus Christ and God the Father as having perfect face-to-face, -face, unbroken fellowship from that time through forever. And there was a conversation that took place before the foundation of this world in the Godhead. And the Lord said, who will I send and who will go for us? And Jesus said, I'll go. Here I am, send me. The Bible refers to Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. God had all the details of uh, his creation and his, detail, uh, his, his interaction with humanity worked out before he created the world. That baby whose birth we celebrate this time of year, who laid in a stone feeding trough, that animals were fed out of, that baby was God in human flesh. And as people became familiar with that, as they came to terms with that, they understood what the name Emmanuel meant. People will call him, they will refer to him as Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Joseph said in verse 18, this is how the birth happened, and now we're reminded that it happened just as God had planned it from the beginning of time. Now Joseph has had this dream, and God has spoken to his heart, and the Bible says in verse 24, he got up from sleeping and he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son and named him Jesus. This is what's interesting to me. Joseph has been given a really tall order. See, it had been discovered before he even married this girl. She's already pregnant. There's going to be a wedding, but the guests are whispering. The community that they live in, whenever they see Mary, they shake their heads. On the wedding night, when it was customary to provide proof of virginity, that could happen. She gave birth to that child. They were able to do math way too quickly. 
based on when the wedding actually happened. Joseph took Mary, and every time God directed him to go anywhere or do anything, that's what he did. It wasn't long after they left Nazareth to make their way to Bethlehem, the city of David where God said the birth was going to happen. And in order to make that happen, God required these two young people from Nazareth to go to the city of their family's origin for the purpose of having the Christ child where God said he was going to be born. Shortly after he had been circumcised, they had to get out of Dodge because Herod wanted to kill this child. And they went in, uh, and lived in Egypt until Herod died, and then God said, now come on back to Israel. And they made their way back to Nazareth, as difficult as it was, and lived there, despite the fact that people thought they knew what they didn't know. He obeyed, he married Mary, he took care of her, and after Jesus was born, fathered at least six other children by her. The record in Joseph's case is that whenever God spoke to Joseph, he obeyed. He married, fled to Egypt, returned to Nazareth, waited patiently for a time for God to work out his plan. How patient was he? He married Mary and didn't consummate the marriage until after Jesus was born so that Jesus would be born of a virgin. And then he faded away, and we know nothing about his circumstances, because later on when Jesus referred to my father, it had to be absolutely clear that he wasn't talking about Joseph, that he was talking about his heavenly father. What we know is, despite his unusual circumstances, beside his wait what moment, Joseph wholeheartedly obeyed God in every recorded case. I'm going to tell you something this morning. I can relate to Joseph. I have had a wait what moment of my own. I, uh, I got some news from God that I wasn't expecting. He did something that I wouldn't have imagined. Now that I have your attention, I'll tell you what it is. See, I was living a life that was entirely self-directed. I was living a life outside of the commandments of God. I was living a life that was wholly seeped in all kinds of sin. I had made an attempt to be religious at several points in my life and never could really make a connection. All the things that I thought you needed to do to, in order to please and honor God, I wasn't able to pull any of those off. I thought I was sunk. I thought I'd just go ahead and give my attention to living life here the best I can, and then whatever happened after that was what was going to happen. And I got a message from God. I didn't see an angel. I didn't hear a voice. I was just reading his word. And I'd done that before, but in this particular case, it sunk in. And it turns out that God had a plan that I, I, I couldn't have imagined. He said, here's what the deal is. Despite the fact that you are just basically a messed up individual, I love you. I want you to be my son. And here's how this has to happen. You just go ahead and admit that you're a sinner and that you deserve to be punished for your sin. And you place your faith in what my son Jesus did on the cross. You acknowledge him as king of kings and lord of lords, God in human flesh, savior here of man. And the one that died for your sins. And you turn away from your life of sin and start serving me. And if you do that, just based on your faith, not any perfection that you hope to attain because you'll never attain it. 
based on your faith, if you'll place your faith in what I did on the cross, I'll place his righteousness on you and your sin on him. Wait, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. There was a moment on the cross of Calvary, the Bible says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And that same Bible says that he takes the righteousness of Christ and places it on us. That's what God did. And he offers us salvation in exchange for nothing but our faith. Our willingness to believe the gospel and to live by it. I don't know about you, but that just makes me want to love him. That just makes me want to obey. By the way, that's what really makes Christmas special, not any of the other stuff that the world gets excited about. If you've never had a wait what moment like that in your lifetime, I'm going to tell you something. I'll be glad to spend a lot of time showing you some scriptures or sending you to a room with somebody else that can let you see it for yourself. Because when you see what God has in mind for you, if you never have before, you'll be just as surprised by what that as Joseph was by what the angel said about Mary. Amen? Let's stand to our feet this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed. What about you this morning? Has there ever been a time when you were something more than just religious? Has there ever been a time when the gospel affected you more deeply than just something that everybody else seemed to be agreeing with and you went along with it? Did you understand who you were and what your future was? How messed up you were? And in spite of all that, how much God loved you? We're not talking about religion. Religion won't get you anywhere with God. He can't stand it. We're talking about relationship. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him. He wants to love you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to give you salvation. He wants you to live with him forever. Has there ever been a time when that really sunk in in a meaningful way and you bowed the knee and said, God, okay, if this is true, I want every last bit of it. Maybe today is the day. Do you have your wait what moment? Father, this morning as we consider your word, your gospel, and all the things that you've done to make our redemption possible. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here under the sound of my voice that has not yet committed themselves to you, Father, that you'd help them make that commitment today. Father, help us in our ministry and all that we do. Do everything we can to glorify you by making the good news real to those that desperately need to hear it. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for your glorious plan. Thank you for loving us in spite of who we are. Thank you for our wait what moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our invitation will hand number 371.